Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Kemmler, and sitting next to me right now is one of the stars of one of the biggest new shows on primetime, Prodigal Son, which is coming back to Fox on uh, January 20th. In it, Halston Sage plays a TV news reporter and younger sister to Tom Payne's Malcolm Bright, a disgraced FBI profiler struggling with his own demons and that of their father. Please welcome Halston Sage. Let's hear it. Hey. Hi. Hi. Hello. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, congrats on the show and coming back after uh, after the winter or during the winter. Yes, winter premiere. <laughs> winter premiere, January 20th. Um, so talk to me about what it was like um, getting on Prodigal Son and what it was like getting this character and understanding her. So I was very excited when I, um, when I first read the script for Prodigal Son because a couple months earlier I had seen, I was ordering some books on Amazon and you know how at the bottom it always says, readers also bought... Um, and there had been a book called uh, Serial Killer's Daughter. What were the books that you were buying? Well, <laughs> that I can't stay on TV. But, oh. um, no, I'm kidding. But she, and I just, I took a picture of it because I thought that was a really interesting character idea. Um, just to, to imagine waking up in the morning and knowing that you share blood with someone who has the capacity to kill people. And so I had taken a picture of it and then just a couple... Um, of weeks later, I, I got the script for Prodigal Son, and it just felt like really perfect timing. And now, um, as we saw in that clip, uh, which is from the last episode prior to the winter break, um, your character has interviewed, done a big TV interview with her father, which has caused the family a certain amount of pain, and I think her as well, although it sort of skyrocketed her career a little bit. What is it like playing someone who is sort of so ruthlessly ambitious? Um, that's a good question. And I, I always, now that I, when I do these interviews, I'm always like kind of watching you and I'm like, oh, how is he asking? Cause it's been such a, a oh. key part. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, I watched a lot of Barbara Walters, um, and a lot of different, um, news programs of, of journalists interviewing people to kind of prep for that scene where she's interviewing her father. And I think it just really shows that Ainsley really wants to put her family's history behind her and um, kind of forge a new path for her in her own life. Um, and her career was a very good way to do that. It just so happens that her, the way for her to get ahead at work um, involves... Exploiting her exploiting family Exploiting her family. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think... So do you find a way... I mean, what you just said about her putting her the past behind her, that's clearly a way for you as the actress playing the character to sort of justify what she does in a way that doesn't that doesn't make it villainous or doesn't make it malicious in any way although there might be an aspect of it that is that for you to play it you have to think of it as altruistic in some way exactly um are you an actor <laughs> that's exactly that's exactly what you you have to do i think to understand these characters and to get inside their brains you have to understand why um their actions are what they are and i think you know, to it, everyone kind of falls, there's a very universal theme of, you know, kind of being afraid of becoming your parents or being afraid that your parents imprint on you in some um, crazy way. And when your parent is a serial killer, I think you want to do everything you it's can. It's the extreme version it's of that fear. It's the most extreme yeah. version um, of that fear. And I think for Ainsley, she just wants, she, she has to, just think about her a way that she can change her life and in this moment it's it's by succeeding in her career you know i talk to actors all the time obviously that's the gig uh but specifically about this idea of like needing to sort of justify the character's actions so that you don't judge them yeah. in any way and people do that in their daily life all the time. Most people are not acting maliciously. There is some sort of self-justification. Have you found that doing that with your characters, I've never actually asked anybody this before because I just thought of it, but have you ever found that doing that with your characters has helped you in your real life with people when you are interacting with someone who on the face of it could seem malicious or have a ill intent, but you can sort of think about how they're justifying it? Sure, oh, definitely, of course. I think. Um, it's always, you're always thinking of the intention in the scene and, and why you're saying what you're saying to who you're saying it um, uh, to. And I think I especially started to notice it in my daily life when I was filming Before I Fall. Um, I played a character who um, could be considered a mean girl. And I had to 
kind of understand what it's and I've and I've in my own life I went to an all-girls high school I have a lot of experience with um, girls who can be not so nice and I think when I was working on that movie in my day-to-day life I really stopped to think about why why someone might lash out to someone else and maybe it's because they feel so broken on the inside that the only way for them to feel any sense of power is to take it out on someone else so I think just to always keep in mind, um, you know, every, everyone is having their own kind of day. And maybe you meet someone on a bad day. Maybe you meet someone on a good day. And your experience with them is completely different than someone else's experience. And it all just kind of, kind of has to do, it's all situational. Yeah. Uh, everyone's going through their own battle on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, what is it like working with uh, with Tom and, and with I know, Dominic? I keep staring at them. Isn't that creepy? It's yeah. such a great poster. And Michael, of course, <laughs> as well. I know, they're both in there. Um, I've heard that Michael likes to keep the set extremely light and is joking around amazing. all the time. Yeah, it's actually, that's the scariest part of the show is how easily he's able to turn it on and off. <laughs> um, he's super talented um, in that way. And Tom is amazing. Tom is the biggest sweetheart um, uh, in the world and obviously so amazingly talented. And I love the, something I also really, um, was excited about with this show was that it was a crime drama, but it was really, there was a whole separate storyline based on the family. And that really gets into, um, these amazing characters that our showrunners, um, kind of introduced into the world. Uh, and they're also different and um, There's also dynamic. a sense of humor with the family as well, which is unexpected in this very dark show. It is, and that's also something that I, I didn't expect when I read the script to about a serial killer and his family. I didn't expect to laugh. <laughs> like even just the line in the clip that we heard where you say, ambition is what is good about me, that and my hair. Right, yeah, exactly, yeah. Unexpected joke in the midst of this thing where she's actually talking about interviewing her father, the serial killer. Yes, and thanks to the writers for that. Um, so it is, it's great. It's uh, it's a really good balance, I think. And that's kind of, it, again, just life, you know? It, in what I love about the comedy on this show is that it's not it's not a shtick. Like, it's not a punchline. It's all, it's all, um, it's, it's, like, it's, you a situation that you encounter in day-to-day life. It, something can be so sad that it's kind of also hilarious, or you could be so angry that um, you end up saying something really out there and funny, and um, and that, I think, is a very realistic form of comedy that they bring to the show. Um, do you find that your depiction uh, of a TV news reporter is slightly comedic as uh, as well? I think that's a great question. I th- we've they're naturally comedic TV, TV news reporters. They are a lot. I think <laughs> I go out of my way to not have the tone of a TV news reporter because it's something that's, you can very easily slip into. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah I, I know exactly what you mean because I've watched a lot. I even YouTubed a lot of um, demo reels of early reporters because Ainsley what like was and is still very green um, in terms of reporting, and it's all still very new to her in a way that watching some of those younger reporters um, work was very helpful. And And if you want to be a TV news anchor or reporter, if that's what you want, you are then emulating for a while at the beginning of your career other news reporters, which means you are going into the job going like, and we spoke to him later that evening. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. It's a lot about, it's, you know, very lyrical, the way that they report. And, um, and I even asked, uh, we had a guest star in a later episode who actually had, um, was on the side, um, a news reporter and he'd kind of fill in and do little spots here and there on local channels. And I asked him, I was like, how do you pick the words to hit? Like, cause you never know, maybe they're just kind of like singing it. Maybe it's just second nature at a certain point. But they, it's it's really the details and the facts. Um, but I've definitely watched my fair share of news and in uh, the Today Show, Good Morning Mary, all of it. <laughs> Do you find that it can be uh, difficult to not make it too funny in a way? Because it seems like it could be very easy to overplay uh, a news reporter in that sing-songy thing that, that they do. Yeah, I actually had a long conversation with um, my acting coach about... Um, whether or not she'd have a different even voice for her reporting. And you kind of notice that if you you follow up and watch other v- 
videos with um, anchors on these news programs, they don't, it's not necessarily a different voice. It's more like you just need to be someone, you need to be able to reel people in mm -hmm. and engage with people on the other side of a screen. So however you can use your voice to achieve that um, is really, is, is really what we've been focusing more on than trying to make it funny or not funny, I guess. Is that something that you, outside of playing a reporter, think about with your voice generally when, when you're acting? How am I using my voice in this character to lure people in, as you said? Definitely. And I think, um, you know, as a young girl, you add like little, you ad lib a bunch of just little ums or so's. Of course. And when you're trying to play um, a more mature or someone who is, you know, worthy of reporting the news, you try to avoid that and make sure that that's taken out of your speech. Um, you said when you're a little girl, when did you start acting? I started, I started on the later side. I think I was about 16 years old. So late. <laughs> I know. Trust me. I felt even at 16, I felt like I was 40 and I, I just, I always, but I always wanted to act. And I think growing up in LA, it was hard. My parents are not in the business. Um, and it was hard for them to know if it was something I had actually wanted or if it was something I just saw around me growing up, right. um, where I grew up. And so... Because even though they're not in the business, that doesn't mean that you're not still surrounded by the business and probably going to school with kids who are doing it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so at the time, I was obviously really frustrated. Um, but... It, but looking back on it, I feel grateful because I, I rode horses for eight years. I went to high school, um, and I, I had kind of a very uh, separate experience from my experience in my work life. Right, being now. like 10 years old and knowing I <laughs> what the, the points on the back end that you and your family are going to make from some movie that you did or something. Right, yeah, yeah I'm grateful. I, I wasn't thinking about that. I was just thinking about ponies. <laughs> <laughs> so what, uh, you started when you were 16. Did you start auditioning for things at 16 or was that just doing like school theater? You. It was kind of both. So I had done school plays in my el when I was in elementary school. And then in high school, I transitioned and I focused more on equestrian. And then when I was 16, I had uh, met my agent when I was 10 at a family friend's house. I was putting on a little show at a dinner table. Um, and he was like, she has something. And my parents were like, you're creepy. Go away. <laughs> and he's like, no, this is my job. Like, I know. And so finally, I turned 16 and my parents said, yeah, let's give it a, you can, you can give it a shot. They felt comfortable that, like, I had grown up enough and become my own person to a point where, like, I wouldn't be influenced by all of the rejection and um, being on set with, you know, people who are obviously much older than you. And anyway, so I, I finally call up this guy and I'm like, Hi, I'm ready to act. And he's like, well, I don't, I don't know if you can actually act. You were a funny kid, but um, I work at a real agency. Like, I, it, uh, make me a tape, and maybe I can send it to some people and help you out. And so I made a tape, and I sent it in. And he was like, this is interesting. Let me send you on a, an audition just so you can meet the casting directors. Maybe they know a manager or something they can set you up with. And I went in, and I ended up getting a call the next day. I was in my AP US history class. My mom, she texted me. I know, I was on my phone in class. Um, and she said, come outside, I have gigantic news. The show had been called Gigantic, and I ended up testing for it, but not getting it. Um, but still, it was like kind of this crazy experience. Oh, you had a call back and then a test, you tested yeah, for it, wow. The, yeah, very next day, so in my first audition ever. So it was very um, surreal and crazy timing. I didn't even know what that meant, really. I'm testing it's kind of the final process and um, the final step in the audition process. And so I, even though I didn't get the show, I, I got an agent <laughs> and I was able to start auditioning. And What was the first thing that you ended up getting? Um, it was, it was uh, later that year I auditioned for another pilot um, called How to Rock mm -hmm. and it got picked up um, two weeks before my high school graduation. So it was good timing. It got picked yeah. up. So did you? Was that a full? Se did you do, do a full season of that show? Excuse yeah, me. Yeah, we did. We did. Oh, okay. Um, it was a while ago. Right. So, but it was really fun. It was a great first experience. I worked with a lot of um, great actors and um, great directors. It was, and it was like kind of we were shooting at Paramount, which was amazing. It's um, pretty much as dreamy as it gets when you think of a movie lot. 
um, or a studio. And it, I always called it my college campus. <laughs> it's so funny because I've been on those lots and they are as dreamy as it gets, yet at the same time, like not, a, they're still just people working. Oh, for sure. Yeah. You know, which is sort of what I love about them is that you show up on the lot and you're like, wow, a lot. And you're like, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a with liter- like cars <laughs> and like big buildings with sets in them, but like it's a lot. Yeah, you stop to like stare too long and you like get hit by someone on their bike trying yeah. to go get coffee. <laughs> um, I think we have time for a couple questions from the audience. Who's a yeah. question? Right here. Hi. Hi. Hi, Austin. Hi. Hi. So my question is, what is your favorite true crime story? Ooh, um, that's a great question. I've <sighs> Been listening. I mean, Tom um, actually got me hooked on um, a couple different podcasts. Happy Face, I think, was a really informative one for me, especially because it is about a serial killer's daughter. Um, And there are so many now um, out there. I was actually uh, just listening to Dr. Death the other night. I don't know if anyone has listened to that. Um, It's as intense as it sounds. But, uh, yeah, I'd say those are my favorites. Did you have an interest in this? I mean, I know you took a picture on Amazon, and you won't tell us what books <laughs> you bought that made Amazon uh, recommend this book for you. But did you have... It's research. Did you have a passing interest in sort of true crime and serial killers prior to doing this? Definitely. I think anything that deals with um, the human psyche is fascinating. Like, uh, Girl Interrupted is one of my all-time favorite movies, and just kind of trying to understand what makes someone sane versus insane um, is has always been a theme that has interested me. Uh, one more. Right here. Hi. Hi. Uh, what has been your favorite episode of the show so far? <gasps> oh, oh, it's one that hasn't aired yet that we just filmed right before Christmas. Um... That was very exciting for a lot of different reasons, uh, mainly because um, Ainsley gets a promotion and we got to shoot in a studio on a news in a real newsroom, which was fun. But as far as um, episodes that have aired, um, probably the Q and A episode with my father, because I, I was excited to finally because Ainsley had hadn't met her dad since she was a very small child, and um, I was really curious to see the dynamic between the two of them. And um, we had seen so much of, um, of, of you know, uh, this, the father-son relationship. I was very excited to finally start to get into the father-daughter world of things. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thanks Congratulations on the show. Uh, Prodigal you. Son returns to Fox on January 20th. Yes. Right? Uh, everybody give a huge round of applause for Halston Sage. Let's thank hear it. you.